I keep forgetting you're rolling. You're like the cameras have been running for a long time. How hard are we rolling? It's hard to be. Set up and some of them the set up is rolling, but I think we'll just call it episode one. <laughs> some of the banter, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> We're like laughing like everybody's not going to believe that. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome to Into the Lion's Den with your hosts, Christian Griffith and Ryan Karras, brought to you proudly by Pride Roofing and Construction. And hopefully he's in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say, and hopefully he's in until they sponsor us. Yeah, they're gonna, it's going to catch. I promise. It'll catch. I It'll promise. Catch fire. Well, today we're going to do um, an introductory video um, we have been producing many videos inside this room as it's evolved, as we've kind of created and, um, you know, evolved the concept in our head. But I think we're going to introduce what our intentions are with our podcast, have a little bit of a conversation about our ideals, what our focal points are, why we want to do this, um, and, uh, you know, just, I guess, get ourselves entrenched in the philosophy for a little bit and hopefully... Um, that'll trigger some people to jump in and share this and, you know, um, start to engage. We'd love to have, um, as we advance for farther forward, we'd love to have uh, as many guests as we can get on, including our team members, introduce you to some of the Pride Roofing Construction crew, but also local um, business owners, anybody we're connected with, hopefully even some uh, really wide known or well-known names out in the industry, people who are thought leaders uh, we'd love to have you on and hear your impression of, you know, entrepreneurialism, um, leadership, management, lifestyle, you name it. We're going to talk about it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'll probably, like Christian said, we're going to kind of go into the intention behind this. And then I'm going to do some, some questions to him to kind of dig into his brain a little bit of, of his story in relation to business. And then... Um, he said he didn't know what to ask me, so maybe I'll just ramble. <laughs> but um, no, I think uh, what what was your idea or your? Um, I know we've been floating around the podcast idea from quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, what's what's the why for that behind it for you? What's the intention for you? Well, I want to change things up. I want to be a little bit different. Um, but, I mean, I think the, the main purpose behind creating a podcast and having it tailor fit to the world that we live in is to um, relate to others that are in the same position, see if we can create a community of people who are actively engaged in the ideas that we appreciate, like um, the, the, the importance of discipline, work ethic, um, always progressing forward, moving towards your goal, um, and how powerful that can be in every area of your life. Um, but, you know, one of the main, um, I guess one of the main things that's led to this, you know, culmination is when we've investigated, um, you know, industry titans, industry leaders, um, and this is supported, obviously, through people who you've interacted with over time um, who are, you know, incredible social media presence type of humans, um, what's clear is there's a common th there's a common thread or a through line or, or whatever you want to call it where, the people who are the industry expert or the ones that can be very easily found as the industry expert, no matter what business it is or what area of life it is, they're generally the ones that are providing the most information, the most accessible information, um, in regard and in, in, in producing the most amount of trade secrets and offering those free freely mm -hmm. to the population. Um, and it, it's it's important for us to, like I said, stand out. Um, and create a new personality for the organization. And what we want to do is essentially become that industry titan. We want to become the people who, even our competitors, um, you know, I love healthy competition, but I want to be a source for even them. I want to, uh, you know, I want to evolve the industry of roofing and construction. Um, I know we're a small guy. You know, the, the world of roofing, uh, I was looking at some statistics, it's pretty crazy um you know so that's 170 billion dollar a year industry where 60 plus million or billion would it be of that um of that revenue is done inside the united states we're not doing a billion dollars not close to doing a <laughs> billion dollars we're like a gnat on the ass of a you know megalodon <laughs> you know um so i wouldn't i wouldn't be you know i wouldn't be 
I would be speaking out of line saying that we're you know we're going to change and shake the industry instantaneously, but there, there's got to be some some steps to getting towards right. it. And I think we have an incredibly firm foundation underneath of us. I think that we've done an incredible job. You know, patting myself and our team on the back. I think we've done a great job of evolving very quickly into a prominent figure. And I think that um, it's important to you know talk about how possible that is and 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 what steps are need to be taken to get there and it's it doesn't have to be catered towards roofing I right. mean, we might not talk about roofing for 20 episodes um, but it's catered towards the characteristics of, of people who become industry titans or become successful or the best in the in the business best in brand whatever you want to call it so that's one of them the other is i i'm, I'm a firm believer in becoming a thought leader you know o- opening and running a business and uh, becoming, you know, semi-successful and so on and so forth. I have a lot of um, information that I'd like to give to people who are aspiring to get there. Um, I have, I have, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I've experienced everything, and I definitely don't know everything. Um, I'm very clear with that. <laughs> even in the realm, and even inside of our own office, I know that I'm not the resident expert. I just know that I, I, I have these traits, and these are the experiences that I've had. And I know how to bring in the right people to fill in the gaps. And I think that's very valuable information for people who are trying to jump off that, that I don't know what the terminology, but that cliff, that okay. entrepreneurial cliff. I think that I'm trying to encourage people to bet on themselves. And I think that's what a lot of this podcast is going to be about. Yeah. Uh, to touch on your first point, I before we started filming, I mentioned a, um, kind of a doctrine or, or creed that um, – Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, uh, goes by or lives by, and that's, um, I think, what lended a pretty large amount of his success being a multi-nine-figure media company, Mm -hmm. um, was that he would say the more you give away, the more success you have, Mm -hmm. right? The more secrets, the the more stuff that you think is uniquely valuable to what you're offering... Uh, he said, if, if you have a list of things that is um, what, what you bring to the table, your trade secrets, your whatever, right? Um, and that list is longer than your list of information to give away, mm-hmm. then you will fail, mm-hmm. right? And he goes, that's because you're running in a, uh, you're running a business in a uh, scarcity mindset rather than an abundance mindset, right? It's just like, you know, the, the more, um, which I experienced tremendously in the gym world, right? Especially gym owners. You're like, well, we do this differently. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you, I mean, maybe in this tiny local market, mm-hmm. but if we look at worldwide, there's probably tens of thousands of other thing, gyms that are doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's pretty arrogant to think that that's unique to you. Right. And if that one thing is what's keeping customers around, then you have a pretty fickle business, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, I mean, it, I, I remember um, one, of, one of my strong suits when I was a gym owner was very complex and results-driven programming, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I studied a lot of it, you know, everything from – Five three one to, you know, modular triphasic training principles, like all kinds of stuff that I could employ for certain athletes for certain things. And for years, I would hoard that information, mm-hmm. and I would be like, "No, I can't teach you this because if I teach you this, then what good am I?" <laughs> then you right? become my competitor. Right. Yeah. And then uh, I was having a question or a conversation with a colleague, and he was like, "What if you just gave it away?" Just see what happens. And I was like, well, where's the value in that? And he said, just watch. Mm-hmm. Right? Because then you're, you're, the way that you're perceived drastically changes in the public eye, mm-hmm. especially with your direct competitors, mm-hmm. right? You start to be looked at, like you said, as somebody that maybe you are a direct competitor, but I also know that I can go to this person for an answer or a question that I have because they are humble, mm-hmm. right? And they genuinely want what's best for the industry, mm-hmm. not just their company, right. right? 
And so many business owners operate in that scarcity mindset of like, nobody can know anything about anything that we do here because it's so special to us when really nothing is really that special about it. Right. Like nothing. Right. Right. It's, it's white label. It's got somebody right. else's logo collector on top. Which is funny because I don't know if you saw this uh, yesterday. It was just introduced in Congress, but the, uh, the FTC is eliminating federally, non-state level, non-competes will no longer exist, period. Ever, hmm. for any trade, any industry, in the United States, I did not see that. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, Colorado law kind of yeah makes that as it makes it so it's almost like ridiculous to even ask somebody to sign a non compete because yeah. you have no ground. Yeah, I mean, you're going to spend more money on a lawsuit with them than you would just paying them. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's, but that's I mean to me that's like the. Um, it's, it's a telltale sign for me of, of where a business owner is in their perception or health of what they think their organization is, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's not just um, for the external. I mean, you can see this work internally inside of the business as well. When we first started the business, and um, I've mentioned on other episodes um, that I had a business partner, and it was kind of, we had a very much a scarcity mindset we were like, we can't say the full extent of these things. We can't teach everything. We can't, we can't, because then each one of these people are going to have the keys to the castle and they're going to go replicate it. But what we failed to understand with that is that, you know, some people are capable of mm-hmm. replicating it. I mean, actually, I, I would say anybody's kept capable of replicating it, but there's a lot of people who don't keep themselves firm, firmly grounded in the goal and in the discipline that's necessary for it. And that number is so small, the, the micro fraction of people who actually can take that information and run with it and become a true competitor of yours, um, it's, 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 it's small because of the mis- misunderstanding and misinformation. People think they need to have, you know, years and years and years of professional experience and they need to have a degree and they need to know how to write a business model that's 84 pages long with it written detailed and boil, boilerplated before you even start. And it's like, you know, it, actually no. Because right. chances are you're going to make it through page one of this model and you're going to find out you had no idea what the hell you were doing. Everything's going to change. <laughs> yeah, you know? Um, so that's that's one of the reasons. But, like, we, we operated in that scarcity mindset. And so and that became kind of a friction point inside the organization because we were creating people who were had a ceiling, uh-huh. right? We, we were not a, allowing for growth and uh, progression of the people that were around us. And eventually they'd hit the ceiling, and they'd bounce around for a little while and hate the friction and move on. Yep. You know, and the same is same out, outside. So I think it can be applicable to whatever. But yeah, it's like let's operate out of the abundance mindset. There's if there's 167 billion dollars worth of roofing out there, I don't care if the things that I teach you is going to make you a competitor of mine. Right. I don't actually. I, I'd, be, I'd love it if it did because then I know that there's other people who are going to be operating by the same standards. Right. right. It's funny. I I mentioned this on an episode uh, a couple. I think a couple months ago. But when I had that shift for me, it was. It was about four years before I closed my gyms, and I, I had a very clear, decisive moment um, in my mid twenties where I was like, "Listen, I'm going to instead of training the staff that I bring on with the the mindset of not creating competitors, I'm going to train them with the mindset." And I did this from day one with everybody. As I said, my intention is to train you so well that you could leave here and start the exact same thing that I just ran. Mm -hmm. I said, the differentiator between you and me Mm -hmm. and why I don't think that will happen is that I'll die on the treadmill and you'll get off. Will Smith. Right? (laughs) So, like, I'm not worried about creating competitors. Mm -hmm. And like you said, if I do, I will feel good about it because I know that they're operating at a standard that I set, Mm -hmm. hopefully, Mm -hmm. right? But... There's a lot to be said from the, I I agree with you. I think that anybody has the capability to start and run something successfully. Now, how long it takes them to get there has a lot of contributing factors, right? Um, If, if, you know, it's painstaking and takes a decade to be successful, it could be because of so-and-so's personality traits or some pieces that they were missing in the puzzle. But 
I genuinely believe that most people, if you train them and treat them as if they are all equal, right, in the organization, and you don't withhold things, like you said, right, keep certain things from them because we don't want them to, you know, leave here and start their own company, I think it's the opposite. I think usually the more exposure you give people, the more it motivates them because of transparency, right? And two, I also think it, I think a lot of people leave to start a business because they have a skewed vision of what, or a skewed view of what it is because they see the good stuff and the easy stuff. They don't see the, you know, two years ago, Christian in his basement for four days dying of COVID, right? And still working eight hours a day in his basement, quarantining himself. Like I literally, you literally sounded like death. Mm -hmm. I still sold the $74,000 job. Right. (laughs) But like what, what a lot of people don't have, and I would say in in some instances it's 1% or less than 1% is the internal motivating or drive factor to turn the on switch on when everything in your body and brain is telling you, I can't. That's a, that, I mean, I think that's where that, the series we did on wrestling, that really helped um, right. for you and me in our professional careers. And everybody has their own, sorry, I got some, I was on the field all day and I got sunscreen on my face, now it's leaking into my eyes. Nice. So I am not crying right now. This is not an emotional concept right now. <laughs> but anyways, um, there, there, there's one thing that I can say that, that, that has helped me dramatically, and I think it stems from sports and, and particularly wrestling, which was um, I, I'm okay with doing the things nobody else wants to do because I understand that there is a, uh, a, there's a value in it, mm-hmm. right? And I'm okay with delayed gratification. I'm okay with you know, watching the attrition happen around me, and I just have a longer fuse. Mm -hmm. than everybody else does so if we go on to the you know the subject of of doing the things that nobody else wants to do and being like you said okay with it right doing the boring shit Mm -hmm. um or the or the stuff that's you know could not be boring it could just be very difficult it's not glamorous right yeah right well it makes me think of like it's funny because I, I I have an interaction with one of our guys from Saturday when I was entering all that data into the computer. Mm-hmm. And I sent him a picture and I said, hey, I entered all this data for you, so it's organized. And he wrote me back and he said, oh, thanks so much. I was really dreading doing that, so I kept putting it off. And I said, in reply, I said, it was just a task to be done. Right. Right. Like, that's, that's how you, like, that's... For me, it's like, yeah, do, am I looking forward to this? No. But does it have to be done? Right. If I don't do it, am I going to create a bigger mess? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. in, in the office, we talk about it as uh, letting dishes pile up. Right. I'm really good at not letting my dishes pile up. And then when I do, I, I know when my threshold is, and I have to say, everybody leave me alone for the next day. I'm going right. to be zeroed into my computer for 12 hours. You know? Right. But... Um, yeah, dishes piling up is a, a common thread for people who don't find, you know, the, uh, I don't know, I guess it's like the, there's no joy in doing tasks. There's no joy in crossing off checklisted items, right? It's like it just has to be done, so you dread it, and then you think about it, and you dwell on it, and you leave it there. And that's a lot of times what I feel like one of the big, big contributing factors. Like people, people have, I know a lot of people who started you know, whether it's a multi-level marketing company or whether it's a small company that they believed in and then they find out that there's just this incredible amount of tedious things that they're going to have to do regularly and they start putting those things off and it just, like, withers away. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, what happened to that business? Like, uh, I just went back to my other job, right? Because the other job, it already was set up for them. They didn't, the foundation was built. They didn't want to put the time into the foundation because it was tedious and time-consuming and not mm-hmm. glorious and sometimes painful. Sometimes mm-hmm. it really sucked because you're working. I mean, there was a lot of times in the early days <clears throat> I found better ways to manage my time and, you know, set up my schedule to be able to be balanced. But there was a lot of time in my early days where I'd have one day off, and that one day also included night work. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, okay, 
I did my time with the family. It's now nine o'clock. They're going to bed. I'm going to be up until one or two in the morning. Right. And I'm going to wake up at six. I'm going to start all over again. And hopefully I get 12 hours off. Right. Next Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a, it, I was listening to a podcast the other day. I forget who the, the guest was, but they said something that I loved and, and it just makes me think of like what you said, seeing people who maybe start an MLM or they start, you know, um, affiliate marketing or they start something that, that looks like a very low barrier entry, Mm -hmm. right. But has a lot of potential financial freedom, Mm -hmm. but they don't realize that, you know, to go from the entry barrier to the financial freedom barrier is a tremendous amount of work. Mm -hmm. Mostly because a lot of these people will market to the barrier, low it's barrier people. Gr- great salesmen. Yeah, yeah. That, that will be like, you, you'll make $10,000 $10, a month in two months, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But it it does come down to the, the, I don't necessarily look at it as the hard work. Mm-hmm. It's just the necessary work, right. right? And the necessary work in our brain is hard mm-hmm. because we don't want to do it, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And this this quote that I love, I mean, I'll I'll live by this now. And I heard when I heard on this podcast, he said, "Imagine telling your kids you gave up because it was hard." <laughs> and I was like, "Damn, damn, yeah, damn, damn. <laughs> right." Yeah. And it's like talk about walking away with your tail between your legs. Right, like, but like I almost yeah. felt like a visceral fuck no, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that, like that will never happen. Not on my watch, right? Yeah. So, but it's like. Um, I think a lot of people get into if we look at the failure rate of of just roofing companies, mm-hmm. right? It's it's upwards of I think what ninety three percent, right, in the first year mm-hmm. or first two years, it's, and then yeah, it's uh, right around the ninety percent right. mark by third the third year the attrition rates for it, it, this is off. I mean, I have right. to look at the study, but it's by the third year ninety percent of them have closed closed right, which. To me, at least from, you know, the the stepping back perspective, you look at insurance restoration sales for a lot of people, it could be looked at as a potential low barrier entry, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not a trade or business that requires a tremendous amount of skill yet. It doesn't require a tremendous amount of capital, Mm -hmm. right? And you can have a good amount of success pretty early, Mm -hmm. but the hard part comes after all that fun is had, Mm -hmm. right? And it's like, oh, what? well, we didn't have a storm in two years. Mm -hmm. Now what? What do we do? Right? Or now I have so much work to do, I don't have the staff to do it. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Yeah, I had a conversation with a a homeowner, and he goes, he said, uh, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but it seems like, because I was explaining to him the paperwork and the, the values and all this stuff, and he goes, this was really easy. I'm like, yeah, it was really easy to get to this point. It was very easy. Goes, so, so it's it's pretty easy to work in this business. I was like, it's really easy to get into this business. Staying in this business requires incredible amounts of effort and a brain capable of strategizing. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of there are a lot of things you cannot control, including funding. Right. Right. Retail business is different right. because. The budget is established. They said yes, get it done. Right. right here, we have to deal with mortgage companies, then insurance companies, and then additional vendors, and then right. this and X and Y. And so it's like there's 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 you know sometimes people get real easy opportunities, but the majority of them throw incredible wrenches that they don't know that right. are coming. Right. So shifting gears a bit, what um. Outside of, of things we've covered in here before, like I know that legacy is very important to you. Um, I know that getting up in the morning every day and, you know, working like we work is very motivated by your family. Um, what is the... What is the internal aspect for you disassociated from those things that keeps you going? That's a good question. So like, I'll give you an example. Like one of mine is 
I was always in anything except for athletics. I was always very below average, right? So, but my, my, that, that result came from lack of effort on my end, right? So like grades were, you know, I think I graduated high school with a, a fairly low GPA. I think maybe like one point above not being able to graduate. Right. <laughs> um, but it, it wasn't an intelligence thing. It's just because I didn't care, mm-hmm. right? I got in 32 on my ACT, so it's pretty damn good. <laughs> but um, darn near perfect. I didn't, I didn't try very hard because none of the stuff impacted me, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then that kind of bled over into how I worked from the time I was 15 until I was probably 19. You know, it was kind of. effort, right? So I had this stigma that I grew up in with my my peers, I guess you could say my friends at the time of, um, even my parents at the time of like, one of my motivating things intrinsically, it's detached from my family, detached from my daughter, detached from um, providing Mm -hmm. and creating legacy is that I kind of have an abominable I'm going to prove you wrong type mm-hmm. mindset, right? Sure because not. you say I can't, mm-hmm. I can. Yeah. Well, I can't say that I, I don't have some of that. Right. I mean, there was a significant event in my life. Somebody close to me told me they didn't think that I had the work ethic to be a college um, wrestler. So the next day I signed up to be a college wrestler. <laughs> and I got took the offer and said, we're going, you know. But th- th- that, I wouldn't say, is the main driving force. For me, um, I'd say this stemmed around the eighth grade timeline because that's when my parents divorced and mm-hmm. things got pretty wonky in my childhood. Um, there was this... Um, I kind of went hermit, mm-hmm. I would say. And I essentially... I wanted to become as independent as humanly possible. I right. wanted to. De- I wanted to have to ask nobody for anything, right? And that stuck with me for a long time, and it's allowed me to put in incredible amounts of focus into creating that opportunity for myself. It's um, now obviously I depend on the people that we've employed, mm-hmm. right? It's like I depend on this work to be created so that the the master plan gets in place. But it it. I think that's the reason I'm on the path of, of running a business and you know, entrepreneurial was, uh, entrepreneurialism was um, appealing mm-hmm. it's because it was like, I don't have to, I have to bow to anybody, right? I don't have to rely on them to pay me. I only have to rely on myself and I right. like that, right? So it's become a, you know, a deep visceral necessity for, for myself to continue to be able to support myself and everything that everybody and everything that I care about without having to ask anybody for anything. That's been a real driving force. Yeah. Yeah, It's so like if we peel a couple more layers of that onion back, it's, it's like for me, the, uh, sense of feeling like I have to prove that I can, Mm -hmm. right. is not so much, when I was younger, maybe less mature, I would look at that as like, I'm going to prove you wrong because you said I can't, right? Now, if I dig into that real deep with the psychological aspect of it, right, what I'm really noticing is like, when you said I can't, part of me believed you. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me now, it's really proving I can Mm -hmm. for me. Right. Right? So it's like, what I'm hearing is that you were you were in some sense demonstrated that the people you to re- rely upon could not be relied upon so you have to take that sense of independence and take that sense of autonomy to be like well my response to this is i'm going to make it so that i don't have to rely upon anybody right yeah yeah i mean i i did i threw that one up for you to smack into the yeah. into the atmosphere cuz it's yeah it's my you know, my parents split up and my 
you know, my relationship with my father growing up was really rough, um, specifically because he was incredibly stressed out all the time, working like four jobs and mm-hmm. trying to support the family. And you know, my mom did everything she could to keep the kids, and, and they did a great job. I can't, you know, I can't be mad at them for the way that my childhood was because they were at every sporting event. Mm-hmm. They figured it out, you know. Um, but um, when when they split up, there was there was some. Let's just call it um, government entities that were involved in this, and mm-hmm. my father couldn't be around right for some time, and then he never really, I guess, he never really came back into the picture, right, right, and so I mean he did l- way later down the road, and we're trying to heal that and and, and whatever else, but um, the person as a young boy and you know in your pubescent phase, whatever you want to call it, young. You know, most impressionable, most pr- impressionable time. I didn't have the person I should have been able to rely on. Right. And um, I learned a lot through coaches and other f- father figures, mm-hmm. you know, <clears throat> and it was like each one of them told me, you know, in different ways and in different forms and fashion, they taught me, um, you know, it's you versus you. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, it's this don't, you don't need to, there's not just a, there's not just somebody that's born to do something. If you want this, you go and you do it. And mm-hmm. they supported that idea. And so like, and I couldn't depend on you know guidance from my father. My mother was incredibly stressed. You know, obviously trying to take care of four kids, and we just lost the house, and we had to move into grandma's house and stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna not be a burden. Right. So it was kind of a layered response. Right. It's like, I want to be independent because. One, I don't know who to go to for guidance, and two, I do not want to be a burden. Do you think that you learned some of your imprinting of work ethic from your dad? Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, he did what was necessary. Right. Right. When we talk about the getting the tasks done, he did what was necessary. I mean, there was times where he'd go from. You know, the jobs that he'd be able to pick up, the moonlight job into the regular job into the side job. Right. You know, and he'd sleep for two hours uh, over the course of 48 hours and he'd go back to it and yeah. you know, stuff like that. So, you know, knowing that that was possible, watching that for sure. And then watching my mom was also a big um, yeah. contributor to that because she's like Captain Positivity, you right. know, and, and she's always wanted to, to, she always gave more than she took mm-hmm. in every sense that you could think of it you know and so it was like you know I, I just saw two people that were in front of me in my young days who just worked their asses off to keep the life that we had you know not to say it was amazing mm-hmm. but we weren't we weren't homeless right you know we weren't you know there's times where we we're eating interesting meals you know goulash for weeks at a time or you know bread and cheese sandwiches and you know. listen man those are bomb <laughs> they are I, I still crave them yeah you know, a little mayonnaise bread, yeah uh, white bread and cheese it's yeah. like that's great it's good <laughs> you know it was, a, it, was a, it was a treat when there was bologna on it yeah you know? but either way it was like these guys did what was necessary to right. get us here and so it's like i would be doing them a disservice if i was choosing the roughness of that era to become a victim yeah when uh, when do you think the moment was for you when you realized that anything is achievable? Hmm. Probably right around the eighth grade timeline. Really? To be frank, yeah. Um, I was an interesting kid growing up. I was really loud. I had a lot of uh, I had a lot of uh, anger issues. <laughs> Energy. <laughs> Um, Pent up energy, energy, you know that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I was actually a really big, chubby kid. I was a super heavyweight when I wrestled when I was a kid in third grade. I was like 140 pounds. You was know, a big third grader. Kind of like this tall, but this wide, <laughs> you know, with a bowl cut, 90s bowl yeah. cut, kind of thing, you know. But anyways, um, right around eighth grade, when I when my parents split up, I remember I moved. We moved to Iowa. I lived in the basement. With um, I talked about this on a different mm-hmm. episode, but I lived in the basement with not only my two sisters and my mom, but my aunt and three female cousins, and my grandma lived upstairs. But anyways, it's a house with nothing but women, and so I got really entrenched into wrestling because mm-hmm. I had already been wrestling, but Iowa is like the mecca, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, anyways, we used to have 
two a days where I'd practice with the high school in the morning and then the um, you know the um, whatever you call it the middle schoolers at night. We do all sorts of additional things and. What I learned while I was doing all of that is that I could just keep adding more and more to my plate and my body would adapt to it. Mm-hmm. And it played into my studies. I was like a C kid, you know, C, D kid. I wasn't, mm-hmm. I wasn't a standout you know, academically, but it just flipped in my head. I was like, if I can do this in the wrestling room, why don't I just put the same effort in, in the classroom? Mm-hmm. And from that day, for, from that time period forward, I think I only have two B's right. that I've had. Or, I mean, there was one B in high school, and then I got a C in college in, organic, in organic chemistry. But then you. I retook the class because I was so pissed about it, and I got a B. Yeah. <laughs> I never got the A. I loved organic, but it, it, was just the one, hard. it was just the one thing that for some reason I just couldn't figure it all out. Mm-hmm. But anyways, I learned it at that timeline. It was like I can do whatever I tell myself I can do. If I tell myself I can't do it, then I'm going to be screwed. Right. And it just played and it just compounded. It got it got kind of bad for me at certain points because I realized, you know, when I got to college, because I was a good kid in high school, I was like a parent's wet dream. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like I was in bed at 10 o'clock, never went to parties, captain of the teams, and yeah. straight A student, all this stuff. And then I went to college and learned drinking. <coughs> and uh, uh, I, I, I started actually even applying that to those types of things where I was like, my grades aren't dropping. Let's and I can more. do this. Yeah, let's do more. Yeah, it was like, and I was just testing the boundaries yeah. of it. You know, I was like, I can just add more and more and more and more. And, and then eventually it broke, though. Mm-hmm. And But it didn't, it took well after college for that to mm-hmm. actually snap. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, substances will usually have some point of diminishing return. Yeah. 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 That, I mean, you're, you're uh, lucky in that. I mean, for me, it was um, sobriety. Right. Because I knew. Well, I guess I didn't know. Right. When I checked into rehab when I was 20 Mm -hmm. and. um, Most of the looks that I got were like, what the fuck are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Like you're a baby. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was, you know, late stage alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Like my liver enzymes were that of, you know, a 50, 60 year old man who's been drinking his whole life. Mm -hmm. Basically like close to death Mm -hmm. and um, it's kind of disheartening being that I was in a treatment center, but most people were like, you're going to fail because you're 20, right? Like statistically Mm -hmm. you have a 1.3% chance of making it to five years completely clean and sober. Mm -hmm. And then from that point they start to climb. But like the first one through five years is literally almost impossible. And I remember the first, I would say the first two years for me were very hard, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I was in my hometown where I got, you know, where I picked up all these habits, where I picked up all these lifestyle choices, right? But I remember I went to treatment, I threw away my cell phone, and I came back from treatment 42 days later with... A different car I moved to the other side of town mm-hmm. I got a new phone mm-hmm. it was basically undetectable right mm-hmm. and um, but my first I remember celebrating my first year of, of sobriety and um, I'd statistically beaten the odds that there was a 99.6 percent chance I would fail mm-hmm. and I looked back I remember looking at my sponsor at the time Lee And I said, I mean, there were some hard parts about this, but this wasn't that hard, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he goes, no, it's hard. It's just the choices that you've made to make it easier, right? But every year that I stacked and stacked and stacked, it it was, for me, it was like, I mean, alcoholics that get sober have a pretty shit set of odds against them Mm -hmm. of staying sober. Um. But I realized, like, I remember my first job out when I first got sober was um, I was doing custom picture framing, Mm -hmm. carpentry. And I had a clear mind, and I got really good. And I would always double my quota for the day. Mm -hmm. 
And then I'd be like, oh, let's see if I can triple it with the same quality, mm-hmm. right? Then I'm going to see if I can do custom custom molding. And then I'm going to see if I can do this. And then, it, you know, seven months in, the owner of the shop, Scott, was like, do you want to be a manager? And I was like, what? It's like I'm 21. Mm-hmm. You want me to be a manager or something? <laughs> right? <laughs> but I realized at that point, like, same thought that you had. Like, if I just apply myself to something with, the, with a, a pretty stout level of vigor, mm-hmm. I could pretty much do anything. Right. Like if I can beat the odds of ninety nine point six percent on this, then I can probably do anything Mm -hmm. if I just put my mind to it. Right. Right. And I lean on the people that I need to lean on and, you know, practice the principles that I need to practice to do those things. I I probably can be just fine. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, it's. I mean, I learned that lesson. Nine years after you. Right, eight years after you, but um, I get a lot of people that ask me mostly in in rooms of recovery of like, uh, what has recovery taught you? And my answer is always that anything is possible. Right, like literally anything. Yeah, we can do whatever we want. So, I mean, I I think that. <clears throat> A, bi- a business starting something, you know, a tremendous amount of stress stacking on your shoulders, mm-hmm. to me, sometimes just feels like child's play right. in comparison. Mm-hmm. I'm like, if I could do that, like this is, you're stressed out about what? Right. Yeah. I'm like. Yeah, I think, I think maybe it's important to notice, note to the audience or anybody who tunes in and becomes a, a den what are we going to call our members? Den regular. Or den regular. <laughs> you know, it's like, I can tell you for certain, I am not a genius. No. I'm I'm nowhere near some of the smartest people I've ever met. Not even close. We're not even like on the same you know, field, let alone on the same yard line. Right. You know? um, but when I say I had a straight A history, that came from specifically just doing the work. I did the homework. I listened in class. Right. right? And the same thing I can say it can be applied to the, this business and any that anybody wants to, to own if they want to do it is do the work. Right. If you do the work, the rest will come. Right. It's my favorite saying in the world from my powerlifting coach, Travis Mash. It's mm-hmm. just master the mundane. Right. Right. It's just If you just become an expert at all the shit that nobody else wants to do, you will be successful. Yeah. hundred percent. So, um, anything else you want to add in? No, I think maybe, um, do you want to talk about what types of topics we're interested in talking about a little bit more intro into where we're going to take this thing? Sure. Sure. I mean, I know that one of the big, you know, inspiring factors for us, I know that we're both very passionate about, the psychology of leadership Mm -hmm. um, and squeezing the most out of people, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe helping people see what they can't see in themselves. Um, It may be a little bit taboo for some of the audience, but I know that we're all, we're, we're both very grounded in our spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think in some aspects we have some differences in our spiritual life. Uh, but we have the same level of, I guess you could say, grounding or seriousness towards it, mm-hmm. um, dedication to it. Um, but I think, like what you mentioned, the what I'd like to do, I know what you'd like to do, is is get more invested and involved in a lot of other local businesses. Mm-hmm. Everybody has ev- has something to learn from anyone, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, talking to a bunch of local business owners about what works for them, even though it could be something completely opposite of what our industry is, mm-hmm. business is business. Right. Right. So what about you? What, what topics? Well, definitely, we're definitely going to try as hard as we can to get uh, a couple of business owners on, um, if not once a week, every couple of episodes, um, just to kind of, you know, chat little bit i think there can be a lot pulled out of that yeah for for growth um but the main main focus is uh lifestyle 
um, want to talk about the importance of, you know, um, health. So whether that be your physical health, your spiritual health, um, your emotional health, and those types of things. Being um, jacked. Being so. <laughs> um, we want to talk about that because that's an area that we, we are both very fond of. Uh, I want to talk about entrepreneurialism, um, teaching we, people as many, as many, giving as much guidance as humanly possible to encourage people who want to take that jump. I want to get into that. Um, not just psychology of leadership, but leadership principles. Mm -hmm. um, uh, talk about values. Talk about um, the different models of business and ways of making decisions. Uh, really just want the focal point of everything that we do um, to be grounded around the idea of constantly evolving, right? Being somebody who is better every single day, right? Challenging yourself and the importance of getting yourself uncomfortable. Um, you know, Joe Rogan talks about that constantly. Mm -hmm. I think every episode, if not every other episode, he's talking about what he's done in his life to make his life now so easy. It's all about how uncomfortable he got, mm -hmm. right? And so purposefully getting ourselves uncomfortable, trying new things, and uh, just talking about it. Yeah, do hard shit. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I was talking to JD earlier about that that quote that um, hard times create good men. Yeah. Good men create easy times. Yep. Easy times create weak men. Have you ever read that book? Uh -uh. I mean, I know that's like a phrase, but Stefan Ariano. Mm -mm. Oh, man. It's pretty great. What's the book? Uh, it's called Hard Times Create Strong Men. Uh, There's strong, whole men strong men create... Easy times. Easy times, easy times create weak men. Yeah. But he's, it's, it's wild how accurate he is because he, he wrote this book in like 2007 and he predicted basically everything that was about to happen. <laughs> and, and, but he also passed away like four years ago, so he didn't even get to see that what he said in this book was true. Was true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Brutal. Uh, pancreatic cancer, I believe, is what it was. The worst. Yeah. yeah. Patrick Swayze. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, but no, it's, um, yeah, I mean that's that's the guiding principles is um, learning how to master yourself through mm -hmm. challenging yourself, and we want to be, you know, as much of a, a word of affirmation that we ne need to be for anybody who's questioning, you know, whatever p path that they've chosen to go down. Um, reach out. We'd love to. I don't know. Talk. You can be on. You don't have to be a business owner. You could be an aspiring business owner. If you mm -hmm. got questions, we might have answers. Yeah, I think it's. Um, <clears throat> I think that one of the things that I want to convey, hopefully, throughout all, all the episodes that we do is just that, uh, I mean, when I was starting, podcast didn't exist when I started my first business, mm -hmm. I don't think. It I, definitely I, wasn't around. Yeah. yeah. So for, but for me, it's like, if I had a voice, even if it's not somebody I knew, but if I had a voice in my ear mm -hmm. all day, every day telling me you can, mm -hmm. it'd be pretty motivating. So. <laughs> yeah yeah so well i think that's good for today yeah yeah no i think that's a good intro um we'll dive deep and hard into any topic we need to get to but it's uh it's about personal growth self-mastery how many tears more. do you think will be shed i don't know i almost shed one just a second ago i don't know if you caught that i did catch that <laughs> i have a way with some of the questions that i ask that yeah. invoke some emotion yeah so well, i'm all right with it as long as uh y'all don't make fun of me too much no yeah. no <laughs> but now we appreciate you tuning in um we're really excited about uh where we're headed with this yeah and uh like like i've said you know let's get engaged so like and subscribe um comment ask questions yeah you know if you want if you want a, a directed topic at something put it in the messages let us know what it is um we'll research it we'll talk about it we might even ask you to come on yeah cool Thanks for tuning in, guys. Catch you on the flip side. <laughs> <laughs> Were you telling us to hurry? Uh, no, no, it's good. Huh? How about you wrap it up? Wrap it up.